All right, welcome back to evidenceforgod.org. Uh, our Bible study today is on once saved, always saved, the concept of eternal security. Once you are saved, are you saved forever or can salvation be lost? That's basically the concept that we're discussing today. I know it's a very controversial subject, and I don't imagine that I'm going to be able to change somebody's mind if you've believed this your whole life, but at least I'm going to give you something to think about, and I hope to present something from the Bible for you. Um, it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what you think. It matters what the Bible says. Amen? All right, so let's dig into the Word. What we're going to do, first of all, is we're going to look through a, a timeline of the life of David. I think this Bible study is going to be conclusive, in my opinion. But again, let's just follow what the word says. David was called a man after God's own heart before he was ever made king, right? So you can look, for example, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14. This is before David was made king or in Acts chapter 13, verse 22. Now, when a man is called somebody who's a man after God's own heart, do you think that person would be a converted man or an unconverted man? Do you think he would be a saved person or an unsaved person? Obviously, if you're a man after God's own heart, you're a saved person. And you think about the life of David when he was a young man, right? He was um, helping Saul to rid the demons from Saul's life, playing music and writing psalms, right? He was writing part of the Bible before he was ever made king of Israel. Um, the guy was obviously saved. When did David prophesy? Before he was ever made king. So um, you could read, for example, in Psalm 18, verse 1, there's a psalm about David. Now, it give you, you know, many of the psalms will give you an introduction to them. Uh, psalms, that, you know, are, are they'll tell you when the psalm was written. So this one in particular was written, it tells you in Psalm 18, verse 1, when it was written, and it was written before he was made king. So clearly, if he's writing the Bible, writing part of the Bible, he was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He was saved at that point. That's the point I'm trying to make. So he's prophesying. He's having one of the gifts of the Spirit, one of the greatest gifts of the Spirit, which is to be a prophet, before he was made king. I'm trying to establish in your mind the idea of the timeline of David's salvation. He was saved before he was a king, before he was made king, okay? The next point is, obviously, you know, and I already said this, can David be a man after God's own heart if he wasn't saved yet? Clearly, he was already saved. Can David prophesy a gift of the Holy Spirit if he had not been saved? Of course, of course not. You have to be saved um, in order to have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not given to individuals who are not saved, other than to draw them to God, but you don't have the gifts of the Spirit, prophesying, miracles. You're not given those things if you're not saved, period. Any, any miracles that are done by people who aren't saved are false miracles done by the devil. But tr the true gift of prophecy is only given to saved individuals. Okay, so David was saved before he was king. Next question, when did David commit adultery with Bathsheba and kill her husband. Now, this was far after he was saved, right? Because that was far after he was made king. So first, David in his youth was a saved person, a prophet of God. Then he's made king. Long after that, he decides he's going to kill a man and steal that man's wife and commit adultery with her. My question for you who believe those people out there who believe in once saved, always saved, was David still saved when he did that? Was he saved when he was killing a man and stealing that person's wife? Of course not. Now, the, the incredible thing is that some people are going to argue, yes, he was still saved. Friends, that's, that's, I cannot use enough strong language to describe how dangerous it is, dangerous it is to believe that. Friends, that, that's crazy. The idea that you can be saved while killing people and committing adultery, you're not saved while you're doing that, friends. If you believe that, do you realize how dangerous of a lie the devil has convinced you that you can go about doing whatever you want and you're still saved? That's exactly what the devil wants you to believe. But aside from that, let's go to what the Bible says. Psalm 51. 
Now, this is David's prayer that he prayed after he had sinned in the matter with Bathsheba. And it tells you that in Psalm 51, verse 1. But if you read Psalm 51, verse 10, he says that he needs to be forgiven and converted again. Psalm 51, verse 10, it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and what's that word? Renew a right spirit within me. That means give me that spirit again. Renew it. Not just give me a new spirit. Renew. Renew a right spirit within me. He had the spirit before. Obviously, when he's killing the man and he's committing adultery, the spirit wasn't with him when he was doing that, other than, you know, pricking his conscience. But the spirit of God was not living in him while he was doing that. It doesn't do that, friends. You are not united to God in a saving relationship while you're killing people and stealing their wives. Do not lie to yourself. The spirit speaking in your ear, knocking on your heart, saying, let me come in. Like it does in, in Revelation, when God's speaking to the church, and he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. God was still knocking on David's heart. But God was not united with David in a saving relationship while he's killing people and stealing their wives. Don't lie to yourselves, friends. So David needed to be renewed. He needed to be forgiven. He needed to be converted again. Again, read the verse. This is describing conversion. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. He didn't have a good spirit within him. He needed to renew, have the spirit renewed within him again. Okay, so he was saved at one point, then he fell away, and then God took him back and converted him again. So review, David was a saved <clears throat> a saved man, a prophet, a man after God's own heart, then he fell away, killed a man, stole his wife, then he came back to God, but he was not saved while he was doing those evil acts. He was not saved while he was killing people. Otherwise, friends, you can be a mass murderer. After you accept Jesus, you, you can go commit adultery, do whatever you want, and you're still saved. Doesn't matter. There's people who actually believe this. It's Friends, that's crazy. Do you not see common sense that the devil would want you to believe that so that you would have false assurance? Friends, just read what Jesus says. I mean, he, sin was so important to him that he said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. I mean, obviously, this isn't meant to be literal, but the idea is that it's if your hand's causing you to sin, cut it off because it's better for you to enter life, eternal life, with only one hand than to go to hell. So Jesus is saying, if you don't stop that sinning, guess where you're going? How hard should you try to cut the sin out of your life? So hard it should be like cutting your hand off or plucking your eye out or chopping your foot off. That's what Jesus is describing. And people have this lackadaisical attitude as if, eh, I mean, it's best not to. But if you do, if you're killing people and stealing their wives, you're still saved. I don't know where people get this idea from the Bible, friends. This is a perversion. Next, you might respond. Yes, but but he did come back to God. That's the difference between his, I've heard people say this. That's the difference between a saved man and an unsaved man. David was saved. He did all these bad things, but he came back. Because once you're saved, God will always bring you back. Well, let's look at another story. The warning of King Saul. Now, here's the argument. Was Saul ever saved? I'm going to argue to you, friends, that the Bible clearly does teach at one point in his life Saul was saved. And friends, this should be common sense. Think about this. Would God put the first king of Israel, would God make a man, would choose throughout all the tribes of Israel, would he choose a man to be the leader of his people who wasn't even saved? Didn't even have a saving relationship with him? That doesn't make any sense, friends. That should be common sense. But let's look at the Bible. What does it say? Saul had the spirit of God. That's in the Bible. Saul prophesied. He had the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me ask you again. Does the Spirit of God dwell in a man and give him the gifts of the Spirit if he is not saved? Of course not, friends. You do not get the gift of the Spirit unless you are saved. The Bible says that the Spirit is given to those who obey him. And you could read the evidence in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6, 7, 9, and 10. It describes how Saul had the Spirit of God. It says he was changed into a new man. And then it says the Spirit departed from him. 
it says he was prophesying, but then the spirit departed from him. How can you be changed into a new man and get the spirit of God if you're not converted? I think the evidence is obvious, friends. Let's not lie to ourselves. The evidence is obvious. Saul was converted. He was made into a new man. The difference between Saul and David, this is the only difference. David fell away from God, but he repented. He came back. Saul had the spirit, but when he fell away, he never came back. That's the only difference. Both men were saved at one point. Saul just chose not to come back. God tried to reach him. He sent, he sent um, the prophet Samuel to speak to him. He tried to reach him. He, he gave him opportunities, and he didn't come back. David did. That's the only difference, friends. Saul, did, Saul was lost, not because he never was saved. He walked away. But God tries to reach us. He tries to reach all of us. Okay. Now, the next question for you. This leads to an obvious uh, discussion because some people say, what, do, what then does it mean to be born again? There's a lot of people who don't understand this subject, and they think that to be born again means something that happens to you once, and then you're saved forever. I'm going to challenge you with that and what the Bible actually says on it. So the question here is, what does it mean to be born again? Is it a one-time event? Is it something where you say, well, I was saved back in 1979, and, um, you know, I know the date, you know, October 2nd, 1979, or whatever. Or, you know, I was born again such and such a time. Now, I'm not saying that to mock or disparage anyone's conversion experience, because it's true. There's a time where you were first um, came to the Lord. But does that mean that you, you never have to be converted again? Does, is it a one-time thing, the change of heart? Well, David was changed. And then was he changed while he was killing a man and stealing his wife? He wasn't changed. He wasn't converted while he was doing that. He needed to be converted again. That's what it says in Psalm 51 verse 10. So it's not a one-time event. Being born again is not a one-time event. In fact, friends, it's a daily event. Let me show you from the Bible. Being born again is, is simply means to be converted. It simply means to be changed. Think of the illustration that Jesus gives in John chapter 3 when he speaks of being born again. He's trying to give the most dramatic illustration of somebody's life being completely changed. He says, your life does not need to be altered. You need a complete new life. The first life that you started with is all messed up. So you need to not just change your life. Your current life needs to end. Symbolically, you need to die to sin and you need to be born again. This is radical. This is describing being changed completely. So let's read a verse on it. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 17. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away or dead. They're passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's what it means to be converted. Again, what did it say in, in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 6? Speaking of Saul, it said, The Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy unto them, and thou shalt be turned into another man, a new man. Was Saul converted? Yes, he was. Saul became a new man. Then he chose to walk away from God and went back to being evil. And that can happen. The Bible talks about that happening. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 20. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. In other words, if you escape the corruption of the world, then you go back into the world, the end result is worse than you were at the beginning. Verse 21, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, than after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed 
to her wallowing, wallowing in the mire. So you can be converted and then go back to following the ways of the world again. How did Jesus describe the importance of being born again? We'll read the passage. I'm not going to read the whole thing right now, but John chapter 3, verses 3 to 8, he says that you can't get into heaven without being born again. In other words, you need to be completely changed in order to get into the kingdom of heaven. This is no different than when Paul says, no man will see the Lord without holiness. You need to be changed. It's not something where I believed once and boom, I'm saved forever. No, friends, you need to allow the Spirit of God to completely change you. Again, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that when you're born again, all you're a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are become new. Now, let me read to you guys one of the strongest passages in the Bible. And this passage only makes sense if you understand the concept that being born again is a one uh, is a moment by moment process. It's found in first John chapter three. And most Christians, when they read these passages, they they just kind of um, try and ignore the obvious meaning of these verses. But let me read it to you. Again, keep it in mind, this is speaking about a moment by moment, a daily decision. You can you can choose to follow the Lord one moment, disobey the next moment, and come right back to the Lord again. Remember the example of Hosea? Hosea, is his life was an object lesson for how God deals with us. Hosea was a man. He had a wife. Who was, who was a prostitute. He took a wife who was already a prostitute, and he told her, you know, you're not going to be the harlot anymore. You're not going to be a prostitute anymore. You're going to be my wife and stay with me only. And he married her, and he took her off the streets, just like that's what God does with us. We're all messed up, and God takes us away from that evil and says, you're going to stay with me. And then Hosea's wife left him and went prostituting again. And then he had to go buy her back and bring her back home again. And say, don't do that anymore. Stay with me. And then she'd leave again and he'd go take her back. And she'd leave again and he'd take her back. And over and over again until, hopefully, and the story doesn't really tell us. It leaves it open to, you know, whatever uh, the decision we make is. But until, hopefully, we stop leaving and we just decide to stay. And until Hosea's wife stops leaving him and cheating on him and decides to stay. That's the idea. So you can, God gives you free will. He takes you off of the street, cleans you up, and then you can leave whenever you want. And he's waiting to take you back whenever you are willing to come back to him. That's the idea. So again, it's a moment by moment decision to be with the Lord. Now let's read these verses. First John chapter three, verse nine, moment by moment. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Friends, this verse only makes sense if if it's a moment-by-moment thing. If this is a a, a non-stop situation, then once you are born again, you would never sin again. Right? So, because it says, if you are born of God, you don't commit sin. Period. Whoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, again, if you believe the concept that being born again only happens once, then this verse doesn't really make sense. Because you know everyone that you've ever met who is who has been born again, later on they go and sin. But if being born again is a moment-by-moment thing, that can happen it happens to you today, but then you can fall away tomorrow. Then the idea of that moment when you're born again, when you are following the Lord, when you are in his will, at that moment, you're not sitting. I'll tell you what, no man, while he is kneeling at the foot of the cross, symbolically confessing his sins and and, and pleading with the Lord for mercy and being forgiven by the Lord, at that moment, that man's not sinning. Now, he can get up and, and, and decide to, to go sin five minutes later, but at that moment, he's not. The point is to learn how to stay in that state of repentance and that state of closeness with the Lord. 
and to learn how to depend on him moment by moment and walk in faith with him. And while you're doing that, you aren't sinning. Now, you may fall here and there throughout the day, but you come right back and ask for forgiveness and he'll change you again. Don't be don't be caught up in the fact that you need to be converted and changed again multiple times a day. Friends, God has no problem with that. The important thing is that you're coming back. You understand the concept? You need to be forgiven every time. You need to be changed every time. Of course you need to be changed every time. If you're sinning, of course you need to be changed back into following him. But while you are born of God, while the Spirit of God is in you, you're not sinning. That's what the verse says. Whoever, whoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now let's read the whole context. Starting in verse 6. 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him, so that means to just dwell in him, to stay in Christ. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Again, this is, while you're abiding, you're not sinning. And so the key is to learn to abide in him longer and longer. It's almost like when you were learning how to ride a bike with training wheels. At the beginning, you had to have the training wheels on. And when you took it off, you could go for a little while and then you fall over. And then you go for a little while longer and then you fall over. The key is to learn how to ride without falling longer and longer and longer. And to just abide in him. And you know, once you do that, then you start having things like, oh, well, now I have to deal with potholes that I didn't expect coming up. Now, now I got another. And, and it gets harder and harder. But you learn to dwell in and stay in him longer and longer. But forgiveness is available every day. And the chance to come back to him is available every day. But the goal of the Christian's life and while he keeps you alive for decades and have you go most of us, and have us has us go through the same temptations over and over again and is so that we learn to overcome these things. Okay, sorry. Let's get back to the verse. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath neither seen him nor known him. Again, this is moment by moment, present tense. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. That's what it means to be born again, friends. It means to be changed. It means to be converted completely. Now, is being born again a one-time event or a daily change in us? I think by now you've seen that this is a daily thing that needs to happen. And again, the Bible says that we are to die daily, right? So if you're to die daily, I mean, you, you have to live, right? So if you're to die daily, you therefore must be born again daily. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I live, which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says he's crucified with Christ. How often does that happen? Well, he tells you in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31. Again, we're looking at the idea that being born again is not a one-time event. It's a daily thing. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31, I die daily. If you die daily, you must be born again daily. Okay? What does it say in Galatians chapter 4, verse 15? This is, again, establishing the idea that being born again is not a one-time event. Now, look at this. Here's the example of the Galatians. They had at one point been converted and then later on fell away. And then Paul tells them that they need to be converted again. They need Christ to be born again within them. Again. And he's clear to say it has to happen again. That tells you that being born again can happen more than once. Indeed, it happens daily. Remember, friends, all that being born again means is to be changed. Do you need to be changed and become more like the Lord daily? I do. 
It's not one time. It's not a one time thing. I need to be changed constantly, friends. Okay. Galatians chapter four, verse 15. So here's the previous um, record about the Galatians when they were converted. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear record of you that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Paul is speaking of how zealous the Galatians used to be. They, they loved Paul so much, they would have plucked out their own eyes and, and given them to Paul. But then later on, he says, after talking about how they fell away, he says, verse 19, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. So who needs to be formed in them? Jesus. Remember in, in 1 John chapter 3, it says, the seed, which means the son, Jesus, is in them and they cannot sin. If, you, if Christ is in you, if he's abiding in you and you in him, you cannot sin at that moment. Again, here in this verse, it's saying Christ needs to be formed in them again. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. So he's saying, look, you, you guys are, I'm in doubt of your salvation. Christ needs to be formed in you again. In other words, that's just another way of saying you need to have the spirit of God. You need to have Jesus live in you again because now you've fallen away. There's more examples in the Bible of people falling away. I'm not going to read all of these. I recommend writing these verses down, reading them later. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26 through 27, Paul says he didn't want to be a castaway. Why would he say that if it wasn't possible to be a castaway for him? I mean, this is an apostle, and he's talking about the possibility of him being lost. Clearly, salvation is something that can be lost. Galatians chapter 5, verse 4 talks about falling from grace. Well, somebody who has grace is somebody who's been forgiven. So you can fall away from grace. This is clearly taught in the Bible, friends. The parable of the forgiven servant. Oh, read this parable, please. Matthew chapter 18, verse 23 through 35. The parable is given of a man who owes so much, there's no way he could ever pay it back. That is us when it comes to sin. We could never pay the debt of sin. But he asks for forgiveness, and his whole debt is wiped away. That's forgiveness, right? But then he doesn't act like somebody who's forgiven. He goes out and beats his fellow servants. Okay. Then the king brings him back and says, all the debt that I forgave, you, you now owe it again. In other words, he's no longer forgiven. Friends, that, that parable was told to us for a reason. Not because it's, it's talking about debt. Or, or, or money. The parable is about sin, friends. It's clearly teaching that. You have to not only be forgiven, but you have to let the Lord be the Lord of your life. And that is done by faith. You can't do it in your own strength, but it is required. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 24 through 26, speaks of a righteous man falling away, coming back, falling away, coming back. And what, what matters, all that matters is whether or not you come back. That's all that matters. I suggest reading the entire chapter of Ezekiel 18. Romans chapter 11, verse 13 through 23, it speaks of branches that are connected to the vine. So that would be, Jesus is the true vine, right? He says, if you're connected to me, that means you're saved. You're connected to the vine. He talks about cutting those branches off, right? But then he says the branches can be restored again if they have faith, if they believe again. And so the idea is, yes, you can be cut off because you uh, reject the Messiah, absolutely, but you can be restored again. So the idea of once saved, always saved doesn't make sense if the branches can be plucked off and then restored again. And now let's go to James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. Brethren, if any of you so that would be the brethren, right? If any of you do err from the truth and one convert him. So they were converted. They were brethren. They erred from the truth. They, they, they strayed from the truth, right? And then somebody comes along and helps convert them again. Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his ways 
shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. So they were in potential of being lost. Now, who's Paul, Paul speaking to? Just anyone in general? No, he's saying brethren, the believers. He's saying if you stray from the truth and somebody brings you back, he's saving you from death. That's not one saved, always saved, friends. Again, I think the Bible's clear on this subject. Pray about it. God bless.